to the illuminating welcome to our session uh, illuminating cultural heritage from research to preservation this session is organized um, through accelerate this is a horizon 2020 program funded by the european commission and it is supporting the long-term sustainability of large-scale research infrastructures specifically seric eric seric eric is a consortium of central european research infrastructures mainly for material science, such as synchrotron and neutron sources. I would like to thank ESOF to make the session possible for us to be here today. I'm very sad we cannot be in Trieste, but I think this is a, a very good compromise. We have four excellent participants. Uh, two, three of them are actually from uh, Sarek Eric, Jana Kola. She is the CEO of the Sarek Eric and she will be chairing our session today. Jana has a very long and impressive CV working across policy and science, but what is really important today is um, her background in cultural heritage. She also, she has a company which is uh, working on heritage science. And I think this is very important today when asking questions um, out to our panel. Our panel is uh, Lucia Mancini. She is a, material physicist working in material science. She is part of, uh, she belong, She works with Electa and the synchrotron in Trieste. And she also is uh, associated with LINX, which is the Lund Institute for Neutron and X-ray Sources. Our other speaker from Sarek Eric is uh, Dr. Tamas Belgia. Belgia. He is the director of the Laurent Atos, Itos, Atos, sorry, research network, and um, he's also director of the Institute for Energy Security and Environmental Safety. Both Lucia and uh, Tamas have a lot of experience uh, in cultural heritage, Lucia particularly with X-ray sources, and uh, Tamas uh, on neutron sources. This does not mean that they don't know the others. And you will see, they will be speaking about their experience, some example of their experience today. And finally, we have Colm Graham, Callum Graham is a um, conservation laboratory scientist. He's not a physicist, but he is using instruments created by physicists to understand um, the structures um, of various different cultural um, important um, infrastructures in Scotland. We will be starting with Callum. Um, Callum will give um, his presentation first, a short introduction of what he does and um, a, a particular topic of interest. Column. Good morning um, and thanks everyone for joining in today. Uh, my name is Dr. Callum Graham and uh, as Anka introduced me, I'm a conservation scientist um, working for Historic Environment Scotland. Um, this short presentation um, will just introduce exactly um, what um, we do um, and who we are as a national heritage body um, and the importance um, of this interdisciplinary working uh, between ourselves and these larger research scientific institutes. Historic Environment Scotland itself is, we are a national heritage body for Scotland. We were formed by the merger of two separate heritage organisations through the Scottish Government's Historic Environment Scotland Act in 2014. Our mission is to identify, record and interpret, to enhance the knowledge and understanding of, and to protect, conserve and manage the historic environment for the enjoyment, enrichment and benefit of everyone now and in the future. 
It's important that we share and celebrate this cultural heritage with the rest of the world. It's not very insular. We were shaped um, and influenced by the rest of the world. So it's important that we are able to then share that um, out again. As an organisation, we are responsible for more than 300 properties of national importance. We are responsible for internationally significant collections, including 5 million drawings, photographs, negatives and manuscripts, and along with over 20 million aerial images of the UK. We invest over £14 million per year in national and local organisations, supporting building repairs, ancient monuments and archaeological work. We have over 200,000 members and our sites receive over 5 million visitors per year. Scotland is only a nation of around 5.5 million people, so 5 million visitors is quite significant. Many of our sites have been used um, in TV and uh, film shows and dramas. Um, this is an image of Dune Castle um, used as a uh, Winterfell in Game of Thrones. We provide guidance, training and technical research into Scotland's built environment. We have an extensive outreach programme used to promote the community and individual learning engagement with Scotland's heritage. And through this, we promote the use and training of traditional skills. This outreach programme includes undertaking um, national and international workshops and conferences and the publication of many different um, of many different types, including short five to 10 page informed guides or larger short guides and technical advice notes, which we can see here. A real important part of what we do is our contribution to the Scottish government strategy to tackle climate change and to reduce Scotland's carbon footprint. This is where we tie in the national heritage um, and um, cultural heritage together. And it's very important that we are able to um, to protect our sites from um, climate change in the future. To be successful, however, we need to be these three things. We need to be inclusive, we need to be collaborative, and we need to be innovative. I'm a conservation scientist, um, and through this, we, um, I'm part of a science team that supports informed decision-making for the conservation of building materials and objects to assist in the knowledge exchange between the heritage sector and academic research. We undertake scientific analysis of traditional building materials and the on-site monitoring of buildings. The work that we undertake can be split into the three following categories. Descriptive, so this is looking at uh, characterizing materials and their properties. So this might be um, identifying clays within stone, looking at the, the composition of historic glass, uh, and looking at um, stone and mortar as well. This helps us to understand how they behave, but it also brings us understanding of the provenance of those materials, um, where the stone was quarried, for instance, or how mortars within our traditional building were prepared and used. We also monitor materials. So this is looking at the response and resilience of materials and buildings um, to continued decay and climate change. Um, we undertake monitoring of these materials before and during conservation treatments um, to look at how successful they are. And throughout this, we are using various different techniques. Many of these are innovative and non-destructive in their nature. It's important that we don't um, destroy materials as we're monitoring them. Sometimes one technique is not sufficient for us to be able to answer the questions that have been posed to us. And so a multidisciplinary approach is required. Sometimes this can be done in-house using some of these techniques that have been outlined here, such as thermal imaging and X-ray fluorescence. Other times we need the support of these larger specialist research institutions. For example, um, if we're looking at moisture within a building, we might have to look at this um, in two different ways. Um, initially, we would maybe use a thermal infrared thermal imaging um, to look at um, hot and cold spots within a building, um, which could then identify areas of dampness or moisture penetration, which we could then look at in more detail using other techniques. 
By using thermal imaging cameras first, we can identify wet areas. Um, on the left, um, we have a, a thermal image of a building. Blue and dark blue areas are cold, while yellow and red areas are warm. The dark blue areas or the cold areas are representing dampness, while the warm areas are representing detached areas of cement, harrow and render on the building itself. So we can see in the bottom left hand corner, we have this cold spot here, but also on the main chimney. These would then be the areas that we would be interested in looking at more detail. So on the right hand side image, we undertook a microwave moisture survey of this bottom part of the building. On this image, we can see red areas as being wet and blue areas also, but then we also have um, the green and the yellow areas representing drier areas. So we can look at this um, in more detail to understand these um, moisture patterns, again, using two techniques together. We also have to be collaborative in the work that we undertake. We collaborate with many other organisations to help conservation throughout Scotland and abroad. Fossil Grove is a great example of collaborative working between both different organisations and professions. Fossil Grove is a triple SI site, a site of special scientific interest. It is home to 11 fossil tree stumps from the Carboniferous period, around 330 million years old. And these are preserved in situ within their growth positions. It's a really wonderful site and it's the, one of the first examples of geopreservation in the world. So once they were found, rather than just excavating them and placing these fossilized tree stumps within a museum, it was decided to conserve them in situ and place a building around them. By collaborating alongside Scottish Natural Heritage, Glasgow City Council and the Fossil Grove Trust, we worked alongside stone conservators, preventative conservators, geologists, building surveyors, and our own digital documentation team to help better understand better ways to preserve the fossils and the building to the decay from the crystallization of salts and moisture ingress affecting both the bedrock and the fossils themselves. As mentioned before, we also have to be innovative in the way that we work, but also in the way that we present our data, not only to our clients, um, but also to the, the, the public as well. By undertaking laser scanning of our sites, we can then present these to you in new and innovative ways. By incorporating our laser scanning and photogrammetry data into virtual reality headsets, we can bring the heritage to you. An example of this is when we produced a mobile app, enabling people across the world to explore one of Europe's finest chamber tombs, Maze Howe, in the heart of Neolithic Orkney, a UNESCO World Heritage Site. This allows the audience to virtually explore um, the historic site, a masterpiece of Neolithic design and construction in high definition 3D. Through the app, users can discover Norse graffiti from over 900 years ago and see how the entrance passage to the Maze How tomb is perfectly aligned with the setting of the midwinter sun. As a difficult to access site, it brings the heritage and experience of standing inside the tomb to those who may not physically be able to access the site. Sometimes collaboration meets innovation, and again, as another step towards better understanding and presenting the work. By collaborating with the National Trust for Scotland, we were asked to monitor the moisture inside Charles Rennie McIntosh's masterpiece design building, the Hill House in Helensburgh, Scotland. We did this by using thermal imaging and microwave moisture analysis prior to a revolutionary box being played over the building, which we can see in the background of the image on the right hand side. This box allows visitors to get up close to the building to see this our, um, architectural detail, but its main purpose is to protect the building from the effects of wind driven rain. We went in and uh, measured the moisture in the building prior to the box being put in place and then we'll go back every year or two for the next 10 years to monitor how effective this is. By collaborating with our digital documentation and digital innovation teams we were then able to take a 300, 360 degree photo photography of every room in the building allowing virtual tours of the building again to be made to people that may not be able to access the building itself. And integrating this 3D laser model 
Um, with our thermal and moisture data, we can then gain a much greater insight into the understanding of moisture transport pathways and distribution throughout the building itself. This is where we can see two or three of these thermal images being placed onto this 3D model. It's important that we work with very diff uh, many different networks, again, to help support us. Um, ERIX um, and the National Heritage Science Forum are two of these, which we'll speak about in a bit more detail later on. We also fund various masters and PhD research projects, ranging from the understanding of the decay of clay-rich sandstones to innovative ways of measuring moisture in buildings. I was fortunate to be a student of this process at one point. I studied my PhD at Glasgow University, looking at the effects of de-icing salt damage on historic sandstone masonry in Scotland. By using the diamond synchrotron in Oxfordshire in England, I undertook 4D dynamic imaging of de-icing salt, uh, absorption, moisture movement and crystallisation into historic Scottish sandstones in real time to better understand, understand the movement and distribution of these salts. Scanning was performed by taking um, images um, with a 360 degree rotation um, within one second. And laboratory sources, this can be, this can take minutes or hours. So this was really um, kind of four or five years ago, um, really kind of pushing the boundaries of what could be done. This allowed this dynamic research to be visualized instantaneously near enough, and was really important for being able to understand these intricate um, pathways of moisture uh, within and through the stone. On the left, we have the core of sandstone and red is the moisture um, after five minutes and again after 10 minutes. From this work, we could visualize and measure the differences in moisture movement over time. By drying the stone out, it showed us the sites of salt crystallization within the stone and how this changed over time. It gave us a better understanding of the role which pores the gaps between the grains within the stone have on salt movement and crystallization and the resulting damage sustained to the stone from this process. On the left, we have the, a slice um, through the core um, of the dry sandstone. In the middle, the same slice, but as it's being wetted um, and on the right, um, as it's drying out. So it allows us to compare and contrast these differences to be able to understand this process. From this work, it helped us to determine the most suitable heritage-friendly salts to be used in historic buildings, which wouldn't cause any damage, and what replacement sandstone types were the most resilient to salt-induced decay and damage. From this, we have then been able to use these salts within our own um, properties, and we've then been able to give guidance out to the greater public. So it's just an informed guide that we produced, looking at de-icing salts in traditional masonry. Thank you very much for listening um, and taking part and being part of this presentation. Um, and I look forward to hearing from Tamash and Lucia and having a discussion um, further on. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Colin. This was great introduction into the field, demonstrating the uh, complexity and interdisciplinary uh, nature related to preservation and uh, conservation, uh, but also determination of provenance and similar of natural and cultural heritage. Um, and you also used, you also introduced uh, the benefits, you demonstrated the benefits of one large infrastructure used, uh, that you used during your PhD and postdoc, I understand, that was the diamond synchrotron. Now this is great introduction to the next two speakers, uh, which come from two large research infrastructures. The first one will uh, present the uh, analysis undertaken on cultural heritage using the neutrons. And then we will go uh, to another synchrotron, Elettra, here in Trieste. So first of all, Tamas, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jana. A good morning every, for everyone who are watching us. Um, I was introduced by Anke, but uh, let me tell you that before my administrative duties, I, I had been the department head of uh, nuclear analysis and radiography department. So from this, I was strongly connected to uh, archaeological uh, research and uh, heritage science. Um, let me introduce you to our large scale facility. The large scale facilities can provide uh, various uh, uh, powerful research capabilities uh, that cannot be found in smaller research laboratories, universities, or museums. So we are looking forward to collaborate um, with them. Uh, the Budapest Neutron Center, for which I'm also, which I'm also directing, is one of uh, the largest research infrastructure of Hungary. The center runs a 10 megawatt research reactor, which provides neutron beams for its research facilities. Uh, the BNC staff operate um, 16 neutron-based research facilities for studying the structure of materials as an open research infrastructure for users all, uh, from all over the world. Our facilities are capable to study macro and microstructures of materials um, non-destructively. Uh, we are connected to many major scientific fields such as material sciences, chemistry, nuclear physics, health and environment, nuclear and renewable energy. And uh, not uh, le last but least, heritage science, uh, which I, I will talk about um, this time. Uh, on the right hand side, you can see the homepage of uh, the Budapest Neutron Center with a few figures about um, instrumentation, location of the of the center and the research reactor. In the next slide, I would like uh, to introduce you uh, to the neutron radiography and uh, tomography as a non-destructive method. Once we have a neutron source, in our case, this is a cooled neutron source uh, arriving from our research reactor. We can guide the neutrons by so-called super mirrors uh, to the uh, experimental facilities. And we can place objects, uh, in our case, uh, artifacts uh, or some other objects uh, uh, into the neutron beam. The object, uh, atomic nuclei, interacts uh, with the neutrons and attenuates them. This attenuation can be observed by converter screens, and uh, we can take images by CCD cameras or some other uh, light sensitive equipment. We can also uh, rotate objects uh, in the neutron beam and take hundreds of uh, uh, two dimensional projections at different angles. And uh, from this stack of 
of uh, pictures by uh, suitable uh, reconstruction programs, we are able to visualize the material distribution inside objects uh, in 3D. On the right hand side, you can see uh, such an instrument. Uh, number three is uh, uh, containing the, uh, the converter screen and uh, the CCD camera number two uh, gives a place for the object we are studying uh, by the beam. And um, uh, we also have a rotation table uh, number four, which rotates the object and the new neutron beam is coming from the right hand side to the left. <clears throat> Our first, uh, very first um, um, nuclear radiography measurements uh, was made at uh, the Norman facility, which was installed in uh, 2012. Uh, and uh, the laboratory was uh, um, requested user time for Tilo Reren, who brought us uh, three beads of a necklace found in uh, uh, Grave uh, Gazek, North Egypt. Uh, the, the question arised uh, from, from the uh, archaeologists of uh, University College London, Doha, Qatar, that uh, how was it possible uh, to make such beads uh, 2,500 years ago before the Iron Age, Iron Age in Egypt. Uh, to do these tasks, we have performed so-called prompt gamma activation analysis on the objects. Uh, this method is sensitive for elemental um, uh, composition of the objects uh, as a bulk. And we have also uh, provided uh, uh, neutron uh, or ac actually performed Neutron, neutron radioactive measurements on the objects. And you can see uh, these neutron radiography of the uh, objects, which are uh, rust, uh, rust irons, rusted irons on, on the left hand, on the right hand side. Uh, and it clearly shows that the, the iron beads uh, were uh, made of uh, rolled up iron sheets. Uh, then the elemental analysis uh, revealed the, the meteoric origin of the, the uh, uh, beads, um, uh, since they were containing 4% nickel and cobalt uh, in the elements, which is a very typical uh, to meteor uh, iron meteoric uh, samples. The uh, neutron, um, time of light neutron diffraction showed uh, no uh, iron uh, content in there, no uh, poor iron content in the material. So most of, so all of these uh, beads were completely rusted. And as a second example, I would like to introduce you uh, to an extraordinary case uh, for neutrons used in heritage science. The connection uh, to the small statute from the collection of Museum of Art, you can see uh, on the right hand side uh, as a, a, a bronze statue, uh, the, uh, uh, is, a, is a part of the collection of Museum of Fine Arts Budapest. The, the name of the statue is uh, the Budapest Horse and Rider, which was linked to Leonardo da Vinci by director Petrovich and uh, Simon Meller, uh, who was working with the uh, Bronze Institute in the museum in a newspaper article in 1915. This link is based on the sketches for uh, a Trivulzio monument drawn by Leonardo da Vinci. You can uh, see this on the right hand side of this slide. Um, since then, many pros and cons appeared in this topic, which were collected in a 235 pages book 
in a collaboration with many international experts. Miriam Serge, the conservator of the bronze statue collection and one of my colleagues, Laszlo Rosta, initiated the first set of experiments at the BNC. A preliminary X-ray fluorescence study were made to obtain elemental information for possible activation of the bronze statue with neutron methods. Since no problematic elements were found, 3D imaging and stacked texture measurements were performed. On the occasion of uh, reopening of the Museum of Fine Arts after its restoration, a second set of investigation uh, for localized element composition by PGAA and investigation of the patina layer were accomplished. The results of these experiments uh, uh, will be summarized on my next two slides. The elemental composition of the bronze statute um, were made by XRF. Uh, you can see on the right hand side the points where uh, handheld XRF instrumentation were used in the museum to study the elemental composition of the surface of the bronze statute and from the gamma activation measurement uh, uh, were performed, which uh, was able to penetrate completely uh, the statute uh, by neutrons and showed typical long lead bronze alloy uh, from the composition with a small iron in addition. The tail contains double amount of lead than other parts. Modern zinc alloy brass appeared only in the fixing rocks, rods fi fixed to the back hoofs of, of the horse, and the two and uh, and and two buttocks of the rider. <clears throat> in the head, calcium and sulfur were found of the horse, which uh, can come from the gypsum core used in the casting. The interpretation or interpretation for the heritage uh, uh, science uh, 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 were the follows. The horse and rider and tail were casted for similar or same alloy. Hollow, so-called hollow lost casting was used for casting. A core removal was not complete from the head. The patina on the surface seemed to be developed due to aging. This uh, study were done by um, laser induced Raman spectroscopy. And the casting uh, may be dated to Leonardo's time in Rome. The location of the statute were, where Istvan Ferenczi, a Hungarian sculptor, bought it in 1824. The dates are important uh, uh, from the point of view that uh, the bronze statute must have been done uh, definitely before 1824. The museum bought the statute from Ferenczi in 1914. Now, uh, in the figure uh, which shows uh, how the horse head were irradiated by neutrons in the sample chamber, the horse were fixed um, with delicate uh, fixing um, uh, method uh, to the right part of the beam, and the experiments were done by uh, prompt gum activation. The measurement, uh, the uh, neutrons are inducing gamma rays in, in, in uh, materials uh, from exciting the atomic nuclei, which can be observed by um, a, high, uh, a suitable detector on the uh, behind this yellow plastic. On the next uh, transparency, you can, I, I will discuss the neutron uh, and x-ray radiography results of uh, what we have obtained on this um, small statute. The neutron tomography and x-ray radiography revealed core remnants in the head and various parts in the legs for the horse 
uh, you can see these uh, by green dots in, in the horse, uh, various parts in the horse. These are usually places which can be reached um, um, uh, a lot of difficulty. So then uh, we think that uh, the, this is why they left uh, this core remnants, uh, which uh, gypsum in, in these parts. The same happened uh, for the rider. You can see the, the difficult places are not, uh, uh, are still filled with the core remnants. The horse and tail contain solid uh, bronze fill areas. Porosity of the cast is rather low, which means uh, very good quality of the casting. The wall sickness uh, changes uh, for the uh, uh, various parts of the statute between one and three millimeters. Now the interpretation for heritage science, uh, a careful Hollow loss was casting uh, was used for casting. Core removal was not complete from the head and the other parts of the sculpture. The balance of the horse and rider is very good, suggesting a careful design, uh, designed, a carefully designed casting typical to Leonardo da Vinci. On the right hand side, you, you can see uh, neutron tomography uh, figures, uh, uh, these uh, two on the rider and horse, and the X-ray tomography, or radiography actually, uh, the X-ray radiography was not good enough uh, to um, provide uh, uh, tomography for this horse. Now, for finally, I would like uh, to show you a travel inside a horse and rider on a small movie. And I try to tell you what you see. Now, this is the, the sculpture, a photograph of, of the sculpture. It's nice, small, uh, 20 centimeter long sculpture. Then you could see the uh, Museum of Fine Arts and the location of the Budapest Neutron Center with, with its reactor. And um, here is another example of how the uh, irradiation by neutrons for made on the horse. You can uh, visualize the, the three-dimensional uh, picture by rotating the horse. You can uh, definitely see the uh, gypsum content in your head and legs, and this is just slices of the horse. Horse body. And then we are arriving to the tail. And now you can see a big uh, photo, photograph. And this is a reconstruction of the horse uh, by uh, um, printing. Yeah. Then uh, we, you, could, you can also see the, uh, the slices. Now this is the uh, radiography of the head. Then uh, the remanents in the head, various uh, from various directions. And this is a picture of the horse nose. Then again, uh, remanents. Now we will travel inside the horse. And you can see the leg is uh, where from which the not remove the uh, parts of the uh, core material. And uh, this is the head uh, with the, the gypsum remnants. And now we turn around and uh, go backward, uh, uh, go out uh, from the horse. At uh, the front part of the horse. Now this is again the statute of the horse. You can see the rider of the horse and also the remnants inside the statue. The porosity uh, in percentage, the la largest was 1%. Then again, the photograph. Uh, parts where no bronzes uh, were found in the rider. 
this is another interesting view of the head remnants and various parts which doesn't belong to bronze. And finally, the picture of the, and this is how the laser Raman spectroscopy were made. And this is how the horse was placed in the, in the neutron beam. This is another uh, placement of the horse. And these are um, two of my colleagues from the laboratory. Um, uh, this is my last slide, uh, the exhibition, uh, how the, all of these research were uh, shown, shown uh, to the public uh, is presented on this slide. Uh, this is the exhibition for the opening of the Museum of Fine Arts after reconstruction. You can see a lot of people are uh, uh, trying to get into the museum, uh, which uh, uh, presented Leonardo, uh, the ho uh, horse and rider, uh, 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 maybe connected to Leonardo da Vinci. Then uh, this was um, a camera. Uh, uh, exhibition in the middle uh, with the small statute and 65,000 visitors uh, saw this exhibition. And finally, um, uh, take out sentence, no final decision could be made whether Leonardo sculptured the horse and rider, but we learned a lot about this small masterpiece. And uh, finally, I would like to say thanks to my colleagues and uh, to you for your attention. Thank you, Tamás, for uh, presenting the power of uh, neutron radiography and tomography as performed at BNC in Hungary for characterization and analysis of cultural heritage. This was really interesting. Now, uh, the next presentation will demonstrate the, the use of photons uh, at Ele a Synchrotron Elektra in Trieste. Uh, before I pass the word to Lucia at Elektra, I would like to invite the audience to post questions to our speakers that we will take later during the session. Lucia. Yeah, thanks, Jana. Uh, good morning to everybody and thanks for joining this um, uh, session. Um, I will speak about uh, 2D and 3D X-ray imaging techniques for uh, uh, for cultural and natural heritage. So in, with a complementary approach with respect to the neutron uh, um, uh, investigation that my colleagues presented before. Um, I will uh, speak um, uh, mainly about X-ray computed tomography, and all of you know uh, this type of, of instrumentation for clinical CT uh, to perform uh, computed tomography studies. But there are other instruments uh, that can be used for this kind of experience, um, and especially in the case of material science, uh, biomaterials, and ge geomaterials. And uh, for instance, uh, there are uh, uh, instrumentation that use it for, uh, to, to monitor the manufacture in an industrial process, but uh, there are also uh, instruments, uh, these instruments can be used to, monitor, to, to investigate very large objects, like in this case, a car body, you can see, or a small and medium size object uh, up, up to a size of uh, sub millimeter. But uh, uh, the highest flexibility in terms of object uh, 
uh, that can be investigated, but also in terms of um, uh, high spatial and contrast resolution, can be obtained using uh, single tonalization facilities. Here I show just a, an example, a picture of Electra. Electra is, uh, is an international laboratory located in Italy, in Trieste. It's a non-profit share company established in 1987, managing two laboratories, Electra and Fermi. Electra is a third generation single radiation laboratory and Fermi is a fourth generation light source free electron laser. We will speak um, mainly about Electra in this case. And just to have a closer look, uh, to, um, how, just to see how uh, single radiation is uh, generated, um, looking to this uh, schematic view, um, we have the charged particles, in particular electrons in this case, are traveling in a storage ring, so in a circular path, at a speed very close to the speed of light. And uh, thanks to this property, they can emit uh, highly collimated and bright beams tangentially to the circular trajectory. And just all along uh, the, um, uh, the, the storage ring are uh, installed uh, the so-called beam lines that are nothing more than laboratories where uh, researchers can uh, exploit uh, uh, this uh, emitted synchrotron light for experiments and to control uh, the different devices. Uh, in particular, this, uh, this uh, synchrotron light can be used for to carry out hard X-ray imaging experiments. In these cases, we can take advantage of the high flux, high energy photons, coherent and nearly parallel X-ray beam and energy tunability. So it's possible to tune the energy of the beam for a specific sample under investigation. And the, the result will be that we will have a very fast acquisition of images at an incomparable uh, spatial and contrast resolution with respect to uh, conventional uh, X-ray uh, systems, uh, uh, laboratory systems. In particular, the, the experiences that we show are being performed at the CIRMAP beam line that is devoted to this uh, X-ray imaging techniques. And CIRMAP is one of the 28 uh, beam lines uh, uh, presently operating at Electra and covering uh, uh, really um, the, the, giving the possibility to investigate many different materials with several uh, multidisciplinary techniques uh, for uh, chemical, microstructural, and uh, um, surface science, and so on. And so, investigation in different uh, in different types of techniques. Um, looking to uh, how um, X-ray microtomography, uh, how we record the images. So here, uh, already Tamash before uh, explained how uh, you can record the neutron tomography images, so the, the principle is very similar. So you have the object that is, uh, the sample is installed on a rotation stage, so, and X-rays are coming uh, from this direction and are transmitted by the sample, and the digital detector collects these X-ray images. So we can obtain 2D uh, images or 3D combining different images of different angular positions. Images can be collected in two different modes, absorption mode and uh, propagation-based phase contrast mode. The second one is the most highly demanded by uh, the users in, in this kind of facilities. And in particular, so in this case, in the first case, we, we exploit the conventional absorption of, uh, of given in, in the case of you have different materials composing your samples, you can have a contrast related to the different absorption. In the second case, you, the, the contrast is given uh, related to the interference uh, between uh, uh, different uh, different X-rays that, uh, uh, that have been uh, uh, deviated from at the interface between two different materials. And, and we have to, to stress that uh, phase contrast uh, is uh, can, can be observed also when absorption contrast is undetectable. So it's a really powerful technique and, uh, and it can be obtained in a very simple way, simply uh, moving the detector far from the sample. In the case of absorption, the detector is very close to the sample. In this case, it's uh, put it at a different distance between a few centimeters and meters. And we see in this simulation of a, of a sphere, a light sphere uh, containing other uh, smaller spheres, that in absorption mode, you cannot see any contrast, but going farther and farther with the detector from the sample, you start to see more and more details. And this can be seen in two different uh, real applications. This is a, a mimosa flower, and the second one is a metallic, a heavy metallic alloy. And in both cases, if you compare absorption and phase contrast images, you can see the incredible amount of details that, and the sharpness of the image that you can 
obtained using phase contrast modality. And this can be exploited in uh, cultural heritage application studies. Uh, here I just reported some examples in these pictures. And in particular, the, in this type of application, users and researchers want to investigate raw materials, ancient artifacts, and particular, and with different composite of different type of materials like stones, wood, ceramic, glass, metal, papers, and so on. And the, the idea is uh, to um, to investigate the restoration and conservation. Uh, um, the, the studies are done for restoration and conservation purposes to investigate provenance, history, manufacturing techniques, and also uh, in some cases for economical evaluation or for fabrication of replicas. And in all these cases, a non-destructive approach is crucial. And in many cases, we combine um, X-ray micro CT with a portfolio of other techniques available uh, with, uh, in collaboration with other electrobeam lines or with external laboratories. And in this context, the role of the seric infrastructure is really crucial. Uh, and another application of these techniques in the is uh, for natural heritage uh, studies. In this case, again, uh, we, um, we study uh, different materials, and in this case, fossils, typically, which uh, are a combination of bio and geomaterials. So we can study teeth, bones, plants, uh, and insects in number, and so on. And again, the purpose is uh, restoration and conservation. And in particular, in this case, we want to invest, ident identify different species, provenance, the evolution of these species, comparative uh, uh, developmental morphology, microanatomy, virtual histology. So these are the main purposes of the studies. And again, an, a non-destructive approach and the combination with other techniques is fundamental. Um, so uh, just uh, let's, uh, let's have a look to an example. This is uh, in paleontology. Uh, this is a bee trapped in amber uh, from 20 to 14 million of years old. Uh, it's a very small bee, uh, more or less 1.5 millimeters in height. Um, and it was uh, completely embedded in the amber, but thanks to the use of face contrast micro CT, we could virtually extract the animal from the amber and we could uh, see all the details of the anatomy. And also in particular, you can see, you can see that the wings were perfectly preserved by the amber. They were glued to a leaf and we can see many different details in the anatomy and doing a virtual cut of the animal, a longitudinal cut, we can see all the internal organs and, it, it, from, and the researchers could identify a particular species and they could uh, um, observe and quantify the different uh, the sizes and uh, shape of the different organs. Another example, very important, a very important application is uh, the study of ancient teeth or paleontological teeth. Uh, teeth as a paleobiological archives and in fact the many information for assessing the adaptive strategies, evolution, and origin of different species, uh, living or ex uh, extinct species, can be found in the structure of, uh, of the tooth crowns and uh, roots. And there are, uh, we, as very often we use, again, a multidisciplinary approach co uh, collaborating with different institutions. And in this case, I will show an example of multimodal and multi-scale approach in this kind of studies. Uh, in this case, we combine the, the synchronous radiation with the study with the use of a conventional micro CT uh, system that is located in uh, Trieste, the ICTP, the International Center for Theoretical Physics, and, and is uh, the ICTP Electro Lab is located there. And this thing here, you can see an orangutan skull that has been analyzed at quite uh, uh, low spatial resolution. In this case, 42 micron uh, uh, is the voxel size. And here we see two different uh, 3D visualization of the skull. And here we see a movie where we can observe the different, uh, different um, uh, st a stack of different uh, sections uh, virtually cut in, uh, in the skull where we can observe the bones, the teeth, and the different uh, parts of the, of the anatomy. And in this case, so these are analyzed at low spatial resolution, but so it's possible also to increase the spatial resolution. And this is an example of an immature Neanderthal mandible from southern Italy. And in this case, again, we use the, the conventional uh, instrument at ICTP, but with a voxel size of 20 microns. Here we see a picture of the mandible. 
uh, and uh, the corresponding uh, 3D visualization of the micro CT data, we can see only five teeth that are outside of the bone, but just changing the opacity of the bone. So just manipulating the images uh, to analyze uh, uh, different details to extract different information, we can see that we can observe all the other teeth that were still embedded in the bone. So this was a child, so then some of the teeth were still in the bone. And all these uh, teeth could be virtually extracted and analyzed in terms of uh, uh, size and uh, shape and mutual uh, uh, proportion of the, the, the different tissues, so, so animal, dentin, and pulp chamber. And all this information are really precious uh, to, uh, to, to better understand the, the type of species and the evolution of this uh, species. And here we can see that the same sample has been uh, analyzed at, uh, with a synchro radiation, a tiger spatial resolution with a voxel size of nine micron in this case. And you can see that we can analyze the, only the crown in this case, for instance, at high spatial resolution, we can see with the high accuracy, the shape of the crown and also the thickness, we can determine the thickness of the animal. And if we compare with false color, we, um, the, the, the thickness of this animal, with the, the of, of our sample with the Neanderthal specimen, an upper Paleolithic uh, sample, and the human extent, you can see that really uh, the shape and the and the thickness of the of the animal is a fingerprint of the Neanderthal species. So we can really uh, be sure uh, we have different other information to uh, to know that. But uh, this is really a confirmation that this was a Neanderthal uh, specimen. You can see uh, here in these images. But we can go also at a higher spatial resolution, it is still using a synchro radiation. And to do what is called a virtual histology, in this case, we can, without destroying the sample, that are very often are really precious samples, we can uh, um, obtain information similar to what we obtain as se sectioning the sample and analyzing them under microscope. So we can see all these lines, these fine details that are nothing more. Uh, very similar to that growing life in the animal, very similar to what happens in a tree when you see the rings of the trees that are growing each year. It's the same, this is our daily and weekly lines uh, showing the, 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 the grow of the animal. A any problem, only any pathology or uh, death of the individual uh, in, in, in some cases can uh, create uh, and discontinuity in this uh, in these lines and can give a lot of information so study this line can give a lot of information on the life of the of this uh, individual um, this kind of, uh, of experiments have been also um, done in, uh, for other types of important specimen and uh, we, we can see here two press reviews in the paleoanthropology the first one was done in 2012 we could uh, investigate the, uh, the uh, dental filling the oldest tooth filling never found uh, with the b wax uh, which was detected in a in a neolithic sample a mandible and in this case uh, in the second 2017 we did the virtual histology of a teeth of a prehistoric fetus uh, found in uh, Ostuni near Bari in Italy uh, where the, giving us information about the last months of the mother and the child uh, who lived in the, up in the Paleolithic uh, 28,000 uh, years ago. Uh, the last example is, uh, was to study the origin and evolution of squamates, so again paleontology. Uh, squamata is the largest order of reptile comprising lizards and snakes. Uh, and there are 10,000 species uh, today on, of, of, the, of squamata, and, and, this, and in fact it's, uh, it's also the second largest order of living vertebrates. Uh, the idea was to, to investigate uh, uh, the, the origin and evolution of this species that was quite a mystery. And so thanks to our study, we could give more information in this, uh, in this sense. And this study was uh, a multidisciplinary collaboration between different institutions. And in particular, we, uh, this is uh, the image of the fossil that we could study was called Megachirella bactleri. And uh, this, uh, this sample, this is a small lizard, um, about 12 uh, centimeters long, uh, very well preserved, uh, fully embedded in a rock. So it was very difficult to analyze, especially the, the part of the skeleton that was embedded in the rock that was never uh, being studied before. 
And so thanks to the, the micro CT, we could see uh, the, the both face, uh, faces of the, of the skeleton. So we could uh, carefully analyze all the microanatomy of this, uh, of, of this uh, fossil. And we could uh, um, compare in the morphological, uh, um, morphological um, uh, information of this uh, fossil with the microanatomy of many other reptiles. So we could move the origin of its evolution back in time, uh, in particular 75 million years earlier than previously thought. And this was very important because uh, combining molecular data, so DNA data and, and morphological data, we could uh, really infer about the, uh, uh, the origin and evolution of these species. So thanks to my colleagues at Electra for uh, contributing uh, uh, to this work, but also colleagues at ICTP in Trieste, University of Trieste, and all the users and collaborators who performed uh, with, uh, with us measurements and data analysis. And thanks to you for your attention. Thank you, Lucia. This was really very interesting presentation of the power of X-ray tomography. Um, and it's used for um, analysis of natural heritage in this case. Tamash before talked about the use of uh, neutron tomography. Tamash, could you tell you what the difference between the two tomographies is? Tamash? You're muted. Okay, I'm I'm mute. Uh, do you do you hear me? Very well. Uh, thank you very much. So I have prepared also a slide for this. Um, this uh, we need to learn a little bit of physics uh, to compare a neutron and X-ray radiography. Uh, it means uh, that uh, uh, both neutrons and gamma rays are chargeless particles and uh, because of this they can deeply penetrate into materials however the, the depth uh, depends also on the energy of the the gamma ray and also for neutrons so low intensity low energy neutron and x-ray have negligible effect on the atomic structure of materials thus they can be used uh, to study internal structure of uh, materials non-destructively. This means that <clears throat> uh, neither X-ray and neutron at low energy uh, makes a big movement of atoms inside the material. Now, uh, between neutrons and X-rays, uh, since both of uh, them are uh, neutral, uh, the only difference is that neutron has mass and, and uh, uh, that is a major difference. On, and also there is a big difference between their uh, interaction with material. While the X-ray interacts mainly uh, with the electron shell of the atom, in, uh, the nucleus of the atom is much smaller than the electron shell, it can have uh, two processes uh, in, in its interaction. Uh, one is the absorption, which uh, uh, usually accompanied by electron ejection and the uh, X-ray emission. And the other one is scattering on, uh, on an electron, uh, which also uh, can eject electrons uh, from the atoms. Uh, this interaction is... Uh, uh, proportional with the charge of the, of the uh, element and increasing as a, as a, uh, a probability uh, which is, uh, can be visualized by a cross-section which would be an impenetrable area uh, around the atomic nucleus. Uh, on the other hand, the neutrons uh, interacts directly with the uh, nucleus of the atom 
and uh, is not sensitive for the uh, the electronic structure thus it is not sensitive uh, chemically uh, to the material uh, the, while x-rays are also sensitive for the chemistry of the material neutron cross, cross sections are uh, uh, widely changing as a uh, as the atomic number and uh, the special thing is that neutrons are more sensitive than uh, X-rays for the light elements. So that is one of the major difference, which is demonstrated by the figures on the right-hand side. On the uh, top one, you can see uh, X-ray and the neutron radiography uh, to a camera, and uh, clearly uh, visible that the metal parts uh, of the camera uh, basically uh, stops the X-rays. Um, but while for neutrons, the metal parts is um, mostly transparent and it is also sensi sensible for the, the uh, plastic. This is just uh, for the um, role for the film in, in that old, old style of camera. Today, you would not see such a camera anymore. Uh, below, um, uh, this this uh, uh, two figures were, were um, taken by uh, PSI Switzerland, and below that you can see data taken at uh, the radiography station of the Budapest Neutron Center uh, from uh, um, <clears throat> a mobile phone. The neutron um, is sensitive for the screen, and the buttons on the mobile phone, which are mainly made of uh, plastic and uh, not so much uh, uh, can be seen from the details uh, in the internal part or, or, or of the um, uh, like the x-ray image while x-ray image cannot see the 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 screen cover and neither the the buttons uh, uh, in this case um, uh, if we uh, concentrate on the, uh, the uh, um, uh, microchips and, uh, and uh, the support of the microchips, then there is also a difference. The neutron image can uh, see very well the, uh, the, uh, uh, the plastic part of the, of the uh, mobile phone while x-ray you can see the meta parts of the uh, microchips much better than uh, than neutrons so then uh, uh, that was a little bit of introduction to differences between uh, x-ray and neutrons so i give you back the word to you yana oh, thank you thank you Tomas, for this explanation Colin, um I, now uh, should I leave the uh, screen up? No, you can stop sharing. Thank you. Um, Colum, um, heritage preservation and conservation. Uh, the skill sets that you, that you need at your work, uh, in your work, and the ones that are used uh, uh, by large research infrastructures, such as a neutron reactor or a synchrotron seems, uh, seem like worlds apart. So how, what um, are the particular requirements of the heritage institutions such as Historic Environment Scotland when collaborating with these large research infrastructures? How do you have any suggestions on how to improve the collaboration? Yes, thank you for that question, Jana. Um, it's an excellent question. Um, as you say, it's um, they seem worlds apart um, a lot of the time. Really the key to, to this is communication and understanding. Um, it's really important to understand the practical and applied needs for the scientific research within the field of um, heritage and conservation. Um, and then it's important, especially for a, a kind of heritage body like Historic Environment Scotland, is then being able to understand and communicate this to the dedicated research infrastructures themselves um, or to the university research groups. Um, 
ourselves, Historic Environment Scotland, but also other national heritage bodies, um, really sit in the middle ground here, um, collecting and understanding the needs of research um, and then communicating them um, and, uh, to these larger institutions or, or undertaking them ourselves. Um, from our point of view, any research that's undertaken needs to be applied, um, not just the sake of undertaking research for being able to use a new technique um, or, to, or to kind of show off the, look what I can do, really. Um, as an independent uh, kind of national heritage body, um, we are uh, an IRO, an independent research organisation as well, which is quite key to, to this uh, kind of knowledge exchange and these partnerships. Um, it allows us to undertake research, but also to bid for funding with the National Research Councils. Um, but unlike a research facility or a university, um, again, we sit in the middle ground. We're part arts and humanities, but also part science. Um, and so it's, it's important that when we're undertaking this research that is aligned um, to ourselves, but also to the government, construction industries and the public. Um, any research we undertake then has to be aligned to that as some of the work that we'll do will then affect or influence uh, government strategies, uh, for instance. Um, we're fortunate that we have that independent research organisation status. Um, many other institutions and organisations that are still very important within the sector, they don't have that status. Um, and so they don't necessarily have the, the access to these larger um, specialised institutions. Um, and so it's important that we as this national body um, are the platform or the bridge uh, between those quieter voices, I suppose, um, and these larger um, institutions as well. A way of being able to make that more efficient is through some of these um, organizations and forums, for instance, um, that have been brought upon. Um, so we are about to join the, the IRIS um, program, uh, European Research Infrastructure for Heritage Science, um, which will bring together 21 countries to help contribute um, and support access to the expertise in these research institutions. And from this, we can get access to, to various different platforms, such as the, the Art Lab, which is providing access to archival data. Um, there's the DigiLab, which is providing access to digital data, so that could be laser scanning, digitized archives, uh, to fix laboratory access, um, but also um, to, to more lab services as well, such as um, mobile laboratories and equipment. And we're also part of the NHSF, National Heritage Science Forum, um, which again is a UK based um, forum, which allows us to disseminate um, our understanding or data, but to also share expertise. Um, so again, that's bringing like minded people together um, to be able to, to discuss um, and understand the best ways forward, um, especially when we are then discussing this with um, these larger um, institutions. Um, thank you, Callum. I'll have a similar question for Lucia. Lucia, can you tell me what does uh, Synchrotron Eletra do to serve the cultural heritage community better? Uh, yes, um, in, uh, there are several. Uh, in fact, this is also, uh, thanks for the question. It's uh, an important point at Eletra. In fact, there are several initiatives in this sense. In the last year, we created a pool of researchers so coming from different beam lines, so with the complementary, um, let's say, expertise in order to, to act like an interface between cultural and natural heritage researchers uh, approaching uh, this uh, kind of facility that uh, can be uh, quite a different world with respect to what they are used to. And so we, we help them to, uh, in, to really uh, focus on the right technique, to contact the right people uh, uh, inside the letter, or sometimes uh, we advise them to contact other people in other laboratories connected or in collaboration with the letter. And, and also um, uh, what, we, what we do is also to, um, to we uh, every, let's say periodically, uh, we have schools and uh, hands-on tutorials 
for uh, cultural heritage and natural heritage researchers, and we organize so workshops and schools uh, in order to welcome uh, uh, different students, but also senior researchers, having the possibility to bring their samples uh, at Electra. I can show you an example of this uh, initiative. I, I, sorry, I share my screen. Um, oops, okay. Uh, this was uh, an initiative that was done uh, very recently, in fact, uh, just uh, uh, in February uh, 2020 and the other one in uh, March 2020. So a collaboration between links, so the, uh, the Lund Institute for X-ray and Neutron Science uh, that, and Electra, uh, combining uh, so the, the uh, an approach for, we, we, we did two different workshops, one, uh, for at Electra and the other one at the neutron uh, neutron facility in, in Munich uh, in Germany, and so in both cases, uh, um, cultural heritage and natural heritage researchers could bring their samples and they could uh, perform their, uh, the experiments themselves with our support and analyze the data. And so this was uh, quite uh, interesting because they could also see. Uh, what's uh, before the all Belgia uh, explained is so the, the, the complementary uh, information that we can extract from X-rays and neutrons. And also we invest also in the development of specific uh, uh, instrumentation devoted to, to cultural heritage, archaeology and paleontology. In particular, we developed in collaboration with the ICTP, uh, the, the International Center for Theoretical Physics in uh, Trieste, I mentioned before, I showed some results, uh, a specific uh, laboratory um, with portable systems for X-ray macro CT, X-ray fluorescent, X-ray diffraction. And uh, this was uh, a, a, a project funded by Regione Friuli Venezia Giulia in Italy between 2012 and 2014, but still operational, this uh, laboratory. And so here we see just the external part of the laboratory and the internal part and uh, a couple of uh, samples that were analyzed. So these are, uh, and also we have just to, to conclude the several agreements also with different museums and laboratory working in, in this specific application. Um, thank you. Thank you, Lucia, for this very clear presentation of what Eletra is doing to, uh, to collaborate better with the heritage community. Tamas, I have the same question for you. Tamas, you're muted. Yes, wow. yes. thank you, Yana. I just uh, find the right button. <laughs> um, yes, uh, first time we got uh, into this uh, um, international business uh, was uh, thanks to the Joint Research Center of the European Union from Gea. Uh, they introduced us in, into a, um, a community who are interested in heritage science. And uh, from then, uh, the number of uh, applications are, uh, were increasing. It, it was started in 2004. Then we are trying to get into uh, the project was uh, ancient charm. It was um, uh, a new and emerging uh, technology project uh, considered to be a high risk one. Um, then uh, later we could join uh, to uh, the heritage science uh, projects uh, like Iperion uh, CH and Iperion HS, which is the uh, Iperion Heritage Science uh, is uh, the ancestor of uh, Iperion uh, Cultural Heritage. And we are also trying to, to uh, get into the IRIS project, uh, which uh, should be uh, um, Eric, uh, uh, which should result at the end to an Eric, uh, Irish Eric which is a collaboration of uh, large research infrastructures and uh, museums and um, other uh, players in the heritage science. Um, the, uh, for us, uh, the users are mainly uh, coming from uh, um, 
interaction in these uh, European supported projects as well as uh, conferences and uh, and uh, other uh, meetings uh, related uh, to heritage science. In, in home, we have a, a strong collaboration with the National Museum of Arts, and then uh, it helps us to provide uh, various samples continuously. So I think that uh, let us let me finish and uh, let uh, the uh, other people uh, who are interested in, in our talk uh, uh, give questions. I give back the word to Yana. Thank you, thank you, Tamas. So Lucia, you mentioned that you also developed uh, some portable devices. So Column, how important are this kind of uh, devices for your research, for your activities? Um, mobile um, equipment is, is extremely important for what we do. Um, so I can quickly share my screen um, to give you a quick, quick example. Um, of where this has been useful for before. So portable equipment um, is invaluable. Um, not everything can be brought to the lab. Um, cultural heritage, valuable, um, equip, uh, valuable uh, materials that we're looking at. Um, so again, having non-destructive and portable equipment is, is extremely important. One quick, quick example where I can show you where this has been used really successfully um, was looking at um, using our portable X-ray fluorescence um, to look at the library lights at the Charles Rennie Macintosh Glasgow School of Art. And um, that suffered a horrific fire in 2014, um, which completely destroyed the, um, the library, which we can see in the image on the left. Um, part of this were these hanging lights. Um, these were destroyed during the fire. Um, they were each light was comprised of many different um, individual components. These fell apart into over six hundred separate pieces during the fire, um, and so it was very important that we could go out there to the site um, and be able to do a kind of forensic look at these pieces to be able to understand their composition and how they were put together using our. Um, portable X-ray fluorescence kit, we could look at the elemental composition. Um, they were mainly comprised of copper and zinc, so they were a type of brass. Um, well, the solder holding the pieces together where it was a lead tin solder. When we looked at this, we could quantify the, the amounts of each element within the, um, the brass fittings, um, but we could see that the actual composition of the brass was, was different between each set. So that would suggest different types of brass and were used for each light or for each fitting, which would be very unlikely. Um, when we subtracted the melted solder results from this, we were able to plot um, the percentage of zinc against copper. And we got this lovely trend line uh, where we could see actually the, the different compositions. Um, we then compared this to an intact light that was kept in storage to see whether this was original or a replica. And when we plot these back, we can get an original brass content of 60% copper to 40% zinc, and that the actual differences within this was a result of zinc depletion at high temperatures. So again, we could then assess which ones were potentially more damaged within the fire. Um, and we could see that the intact light um, was not original and was probably a replica of what we're seeing. So it allowed us to go out onto the site. Um, especially important when we can't take uh, items away, but also where we can't be destructive or we can't actually sample. Um, and for the lot of the materials in the buildings that we work with, um, that's exactly what um, uh, the situation scenario that we have. Um, thank you, Colum. Thank you very much. Now we have just a few minutes left, so I'll have one uh, last question. But uh, well, if we ha we can have short answers, that would be optimal. So, um, Lucia, considering that um, community of cultural and uh, natural heritage uh, researchers um, is reasonably small and that you go through a lot of costs to, de to develop dedicated services. Why do you do this? What's the rationale on your side? Yeah, so uh, one, of, okay, one of, well, of the reasons, uh, it's of course, it's uh, really uh, a type of research that is really 
uh, interesting, exciting also for, for us, for, for the scientists uh, working in physics like me. It's not only, um, uh, uh, this is an important aspect, but uh, another aspect is also that uh, this type of, uh, of experiments and, uh, and very often are uh, published on high impact journals, the results of this type of experiment, and they are covered by uh, press uh, releases and uh, also Ah, okay. So then, and are presented in exhibitions, the results and so on. So there is a very high visibility of the results. And this can allow to attract new users in the facility and also highly qualified the new personnel coming to, to work in the facility. And also it's very important for the preparation of funding projects uh, and uh, funding project proposal. This is important, the, the visibility that uh, we can reach thanks to this uh, nice experiment. It's, it's, it's an important uh, uh, reason, let's say. Thank you, Lucia. Tamas, how about you, briefly? Uh, briefly, so then... Uh, um, uh, 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 we realize that uh, any any kind of work we do in the heritage science is is has a high publicity. So then, uh, many people uh, are interested in uh, results. Uh, what uh, what we are doing, and let let me just uh, show an advertisement for <laughs> for. <laughs> for what a neutron tomography can uh, provide us so the, it can comp we can completely print out the sculpture based on the neutron tomography result and even you can see um, one less than one millimeter um, hair at, uh, on the horse head so then uh, this is really a very powerful thing and can be used, for example, in industry to make a reverse engineering and a lot of other things. So then uh, it's not only uh, heritage science, but we learn a lot how to, to get into business, for example. Um, what, what can we do with uh, uh, industrial materials? Um, unfortunately, we're running out of time. Callum, I would just like to hear a very brief input on, uh, from your side on the topic. Yes, yeah, so as um, has been shown already and said, um, community engagement is, is, hugely, is hugely important and popular, um, especially for someone like ourselves that is, um, we have to be very open to exactly what we're doing. Um, one example that we have is where I work is the engine shed in Stirling. Um, this is a kind of outreach at Scotland's dedicated building conservation centre. On the glass, we can see learn, inspire and share, and that's really important about what we do. Um, within this building itself, we have, um, it's a visitor centre um, used using um, reused and um, traditional materials. Um, as part of this, we have um, different exhibition cases. We have a, a 3D cinema, which we can host international and national conferences. Uh, an augmented reality app of Scotland where we can showcase climate change, geology, our laser scanning sites. Um, we undertake conferences, we do impact teaching events as well. We've got a postgraduate diploma course. Um, and again, we also have a kind of kid, kids exhibitions where we bring the science to yourself. So this is um, Cartoon Me um, and one of our uh, most recent um, Science of Stone um, events looking at the climate change and the effects on the geology of Scotland and, and those building materials. So again, hugely important for um, for really showcasing what we do and really making this access accessible to the public and others. Um, thank you very much. So this was, uh, at least for me, this was really a very interesting session and I would like to thank the three speakers, uh, Callum, Tamash and Lucia for their presentations and their insights. Uh, I would also like to thank Anke Lohmann from ESP for setting up this, um, this session. At the end, I would just like to say that uh, it's, for, for me, it's extremely interesting that um, uh, it showed how large is uh, general purpose uh, infrastructures for characterizations of all kinds of materials can support uh, societal challenge such as uh, problems such as 
the ones in cultural heritage. This is becoming increasingly important as we face uh, severe uh, increasing uh, challenges also in other fields such as, for example, climate change uh, and um, uh, health, for example, and all the large research infrastructures do need to develop dedicated services. Thank you very much for the attention. Thanks uh, also for the organizers at ESOF.